to moderate our opening grand panel session to explore how the CMO's role transformed forever and what are the main challenges and opportunities that have opened up. Well, to answer that and more, I would like to invite our C-level panelists that we have on stage. And our panelists are Amy Peters. Amy is a group head of marketing and corporate communications at Mashrek Bank. She has over 20 years of experience in marketing, communications, and PR across the Middle East, South Africa, and UK. Amy heads all brand and marketing activities across the group. Please welcome. Joining her, yes, big round of applause. And joining her is Leon De Silva. Leon is a chief marketing officer at Cigna Insurance. She's responsible for reinforcing Cigna's customer-centric approach, driving strategic brand and digital marketing initiatives across the region. So please give it up for Leon. Welcome. Our next panelist, panelist is Jan Brown, the original marketing director at Sprinkler. He's a mar Jan is a marketing leader with 20 years of experience in technology sector, driving demand generation initiatives and market awareness for leading technology providers. Please welcome. Yes. I, I love what you ladies are wearing, all colorful and beautiful. And our final panelist is joining us virtually for the session. Please welcome Nanda Kumar Vijayan. He's a marketing and communications director at Lulu Group International across various geographical locations and business verticals. He actually has transformed the brand to the one of the most iconic multinational retailing brands today. Over to you, Ravi, now. Please give a round of applause to all our panelists and our moderator. I'm on mute. <laughs> all right, welcome once again. This opening panel is set to you know, give the context of the changing role of the CMO. And we have four amazing professionals here. So I want to start right in with how has the role of the CMO changed internally and externally? I want to start with you, Amy, because you're right next to me and you're in South today. So go on. The perils of having a, an alphabetical inner supremacy. Um, thank you. Really great to be here and so lovely to be here in person. Can you see my screen? Um, so I would say that, you know, the fundamentals of my role are pretty solid. But what has changed and what has changed really significantly, especially in the past year, is, you know, how customer expectations have changed. And I think it's, it's really incumbent on us as professionals to stay in step with the, you know, the speed, the relevance, and the fulfillment um, expectations of our customers and tailor our work and our approach to that um, fundamental shift. Um, but I do think that the fundamentals, and it's really important for us to make sure that those fundamentals of storytelling, of brand building, remain central um, tone of voice, quality writing, all those other wonderful things, remain really, really central to what we do. All right. So, Jen, I wanted your perspective because not only are you a CMO, but you also interact with a lot of CMOs. So give us a context as to how CMOs are reimagining their roles and what's happened in the last two years. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. If anybody wants to laugh about how difficult it was to get here from the UK, come find me on the sprinkler stand. But I'm here, and it's fantastic to be here in person. Um, I think to answer your question, Ravi, I think it's, it's about diversification and then the marketing structure and organization and the sheer number of specialist roles that any CMO needs to have on their team now to be successful. I like to use an analogy from a previous manager of mine. He says he feels like marketing is like trying to move all of the ships out of the harbor at the same time in perfect sync and get them back to harbor at the same time. Anybody who's in marketing knows how difficult that is. Um, so for me, I think it, it combined with the pace of change that, that Amy mentioned, that is, um, that is the CMO's challenge today. And it's predicting what the next best action is 
um, and then working out which technology can help you with that, but equally which technology may be giving you the wrong signals. Excellent. Leanne and Nandkumar, I just want to reframe that question. Share one unexpected change in your role, and what have you learned from that? Well, um, first of all, thank you, everybody, um, for having me here, and good morning to everyone. I think um, let's talk about what's not changed, right? I mean, what's not changed is you're still required to um, be the brand custodian. You're still required to tell the story. Um, in a recent report um, done by CMO Council, where they interviewed business leaders um, about what they wanted from their marketing leaders, um, of course, it was a whole host of things, like Jen said. Um, but the part that strikes me uh, the most is about fractional leadership, right? Um, and it is about identifying how and where things are missing in the customer journey and almost you know, providing that gap, um, uh, filling in that gap um, for business leaders. So it's everything from generating demand, but still um, you know, driving the reputation, understanding all the parts that feed the supply chain, but still making sure you're telling the story uh, in a way that justifies the brand. Nand Kumar. Morning. Yes, apart from being a part-time chef and baker like all of us would have been last one year, uh, one important role which was added to our portfolio coming from a retail industry primarily into essential uh, good selling is that the role which we had during the initial days of pandemic and throughout was working along with the government authorities on food control and food safety, you know, ensuring that shelves are uh, always filled, there's no panic driven buying or you know any any kind of uh, misgivings about shortage in products that's a big challenge and big role which we had to work and that was very interesting to me apart from being the marketing uh, and communication activities uh, leader but one more thing was getting in touch with various different uh, stakeholders which was not usually our mandate like talking to logistical uh, vendors in ensuring that last mile deliveries were in place uh, because suddenly online shopping went up many folds and also talking to many uh, technological partners and understanding how we could be uh, more agile and more efficient, especially speaking to people like Sprinkler for must say, helping us out many a time. So yes, roles have not only changed, they have added and taken new dimensions. All right, so now let's come to the favorite subject of marketers, budgets. So with budgets under pressure, how have you reprioritized? Has brand building given way to sales leads? So, yeah, in, in a word, yes. <laughs> um, should it? Perhaps not. And I think that's where um, the challenge has come for us because yes, absolutely, there is an increasing pressure to allocate budget more and more to the types of activities where you can see direct ROI, you can track through, and that's right. You know, that, it, that absolutely is the direction of travel. Where it cannot um, continue, should I say, maybe a bit contentious, is that that happens at the expense of building an overall brand. And I think that's where we're really trying to um, focus and make sure that you know we're thinking about viral UGC, we're thinking about different ways of, of driving that brand spend and that brand engagement through um, new and um, faster channels. Leanne? So this is um, an interesting one. Um, brand uh, budgets always get cut, right? Um, and the way I look at it is, how can we do more with less? I mean, that's music to every CEO's ears, isn't it? Um, and there are a few ways you can do that, right? You do that by creating more capacity in your team, by you know, automating certain processes, using marketing technology more efficiently. Um, during the pandemic, media budgets, uh, or sorry, advertising um, rates had dropped. Right, so there was the capacity to buy more at lower rates. So how do we use um, you know, what's happening in the market again to earn more, create more capacity? And thirdly, I echo what Amy says. There's always that danger when you cut too 
thin or too close to the bone of losing the ability to truly differentiate yourself and tell your story. What about you, Nankumar? How has your budget got cut? Was it cut? I would not use the word budget cut. I would say maybe budget awareness or budget efficiency. Budget yeah. resizing. Maybe, right. yeah, or reallocating. Uh, yes, uh, we, we kind of moved on from conventional media or even digital media to, uh, to different uh, new ways of communicating people. Uh, more importantly, we started listening to people. That was key than rather talking too much. And uh, everybody was, uh, who knew anything about retail or marketing were always talking. So it's good to have some free gyan coming our way. And uh, yes, brand awareness was bit on the back, but uh, more on result-oriented ROI-driven campaigns. And also, I would say more campaigns uh, to, to make customer aware that things are safe and things are uh, getting back to normal sooner than expected. So those kind of awareness campaigns, especially influential-driven campaigns, were much more in, in vogue, and that's what we were doing. All right, Jen, tell us uh, when budgets do get cut, do you see technology spend going up or is it proportionally decreased? How, how, what is the trend? Um, I kind of want to answer the question in a slightly different way. Sorry to be a bit contentious to the last one. Um, I think that the reason we're having all of this conversation about budget is that even now in the 21st century, quite far into the 21st century, we're still not focused enough on measurement and insight. The why, why anything, why now, what's the outcome gonna be, and how am I gonna attribute that? And that's why you see this trend to bottom funnel demand generation, and then the big surprise when that hasn't worked, when you haven't been addressing the, the top of the funnel brand awareness. And I think until we can really harness all of the insights that are available, um, both about us, about our competitors, about the industry, and then realign that to customer experience and measure it, we're still gonna be having these conversations about budget and still trying to justify marketing investment to our sales colleagues who don't believe they're seeing enough value. All right, staying on budget and teams, here's an interesting thought experiment. Uh, a consumer psychologist, a data scientist, and a behavioral economist walk into a bar, and you can only hire one of them. Which one would it be, and why? I mean, we have a consumer psychologist, we have a data scientist, we have a behavioral, a behavioral economist. Okay, so data scientists, we're crawling with them. Done and dusted. Yeah, yeah we're good, we're good. Um, psychologist versus economist. Um, I think I might go economist. Um, yeah. Okay. Leah? Um, I would say behavioral psychologist. Um, you know, you, you, we're spending a lot of time understanding a consumer. And as, um, you know, things change and the market is moving so quickly, um, needs change and consumer trends change. So behavioral psychology is an important part of how you talk to your customers. Well, actually, you mixed up two designations, behavioral psychologist, which is, which is a I unique one. That one too. So, that's, <laughs> so that's a new one. Jen, what about what you? Was the, what was the first one you said? We have consumer psychologist, data scientist is out now, and we have behavioral economist. Like a true marketeer. <laughs> Obviously, I'm greedy to have all of them, surely. But yes, a consumer is something which is close to our heart. So I would love to have an expert who can tell me what really consumer is looking forward to. So that's the one person I should be looking at. Jen, what about you? As long as they care about the customer, I'll have all three, thank you. Back that's to it. my harbor analogy. I want to open this to the audience. So people who in favor of data scientists, hands up. No one? No oh, one wants to hire data, data scientists data anymore? Scientists. What about consumer psychologists? Yeah. Hmm. All right. So the last one is behavioral economist. OK, all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So technology obviously plays such a big role in our businesses now. How are you reconfiguring your team to adapt to this new reality? Um, so, 
Marketing ops is a thing in many companies. It is sadly not really a thing in, in banking. So that's my first port of call is building a marketing ops functionality at Mashrek. Um, the connectivity that that needs to have um, within an, a, you know, an overall agile operating system, again, then starts to drive changes in how we're structuring the team and the skills and the resources that we need to build that. But to go back to Jen's point, I think it's absolutely critical that we have that um, capability centrally to both manage the data flows that we are responsible for, plug them into the relevant dashboards that our sales teams need, and ensure that we have the right metric, uh, measurement models and metrics coming out the back end. And to me, that is um, creating a marketing ops function. So Leon, I want to change that a bit. What were the skill gaps that you discovered in your team over the last two years, and how did you fill that gap? Um, I would say, I mean, in terms of gaps, um, it's more from the perspective of when I hire, right? Um, most times you get specialists in a particular field, but really uh, the skills that I look for are more around having the, the right attitude and the ability to see what a candidate is able to do with those skills, right? So almost every marketeer should already have a data scientist outlook, um, what he's doing, why he's doing it, and what is the data telling him based on which he wants to take action. So rather than, um, you know, look at spe specific skills, I do think marketeers need to have um, a, a data mindset, a KPI-driven mindset, but then use that to either find innovative ways of delivering um, against an objective or being able to see where the gaps are so that they can find the right technology to fill that. So it's more about an attitude of what they have the capability to do rather than specific skills. All right, so I want to reframe that question for Nanda Kumar and Jen. Do you think CMOs should be technologists first and strategists later or vice versa? I mean. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I will take neither uh, Jen or Sprinkler has paid me money, but one of the companies which, who, with whom we had first dialogues was Sprinkler. And I remember having a session with Reggie, CEO. It was quite enlightening to say the least. And that was where we picked up many nuances. Obviously, a no-brainer data scientists, data analysts are key to our industry, especially for a hypermarket or an or a omni-channel business uh, such as us uh, to talk to uh, millions of shoppers who shop with us every day or come to us, data scientists, data analysts, absolutely necessary. But we also wanted to know how we could uh, enhance the experience of our shoppers, what, listen to them. I keep using the word listening to customers. That's what I've heard uh, many of them speak last one and a half years. And also work extensively on last mile delivery in our business, which was key to us. So technology has helped us in all these three areas to understand our consumer to understand their behavior and how we can serve them better. So yes, uh, technology is being leader in this industry now and we all should soon become CTOs and CEO merge together with CMOs. Jen, what do you think? Technologists first? Um, isn't it surprising that the lady from the technology company is not gonna say that? Um, I hope that's refreshing actually. I, I think the challenge is that we are we are technology first rather than discovery first and truly understanding our customer and their needs. So, so for example, you know, um, if you come to the Sprinkler stand today, we're just gonna have a conversation with you. We're not gonna demo the product. Demo what? What do you need, right? Um, I wanna go back to my point at the beginning about diversification and the, the dichotomy um, is that in order to get true diversification and to deliver a great customer experience within the teams and the structure, you need unity. And that's where the technology comes into play. To deliver a unified customer experience, all of your teams have to be aligned. And I don't know about you, but I've been on enough Zoom calls for the last 18 months, and that's not fixing the problem. We need to be able to hand off to each other and to make sure that we're reusing content, to make sure that our content is insights driven, and that's where the focus needs to be. 
Um, and I think there's too much focus in job descriptions on the specific requirements of that role and not enough on their contributing um, skills to the wider picture, taking up, your, taking up your point. Interesting. So to wrap up this session, again, I have a multi-choice question. Uh, what would be the natural role extension for a CMO? Chief Growth Officer, Chief Experience Officer, Chief Storyteller. One word answer, or one designation answer. Oh, I don't like these. Um, my CEO would say growth. I think that growth is all of our responsibilities on our exco. I would, I'm just gonna stick with storyteller. I think it is our responsibility to ensure that story can be told by everybody at every touch point. It is cohesive, coherent, and meaningful to our customer. And I think that's still central to our role. So I'm gonna stick with that. Well said. Yeah. You said one word. One designation. <laughs> I'm going to say amalgamation. <laughs> well, because you can't, you know, that, that's what the CMO is starting to evolve towards being, right? We're starting to, um, business leaders want us to, to look at the gaps that exist, and we're almost inadvertently having to fill those gaps, whether it is customer experience or chief growth. The, the, the issue with chief growth is you don't want to just look at growth without looking at um, earnings or sustainability, which is why I didn't didn't pick that. So it's about you know where your company is at a space and time and what the market's demanding um, of you. So amalgamation. Jen Nand Kumar. Um, experience is everybody's responsibility in the company, not just the CMOs. It's the CMOs' job to tell the story and evangelize why customer experience has to be the number one and then for everybody to tell that story. We all are supposed to be storytellers. That's why we are in this place, first place. Uh, but yes, uh, increasingly CMOs are being judged on their uh, not only marketing skills, but even to extend revenue generation skills and business acquisition skills. So I would say chief growth officer. All right, so we have about six seconds now. I want to just ask the audience which of the three, Chief Growth Officer, hands up. Not many. Chief Experience Officer. All right, the last one, Chief Storyteller. Guys, yes. All right, with that, it's a wrap. Thank you so much for this session. I had an amazing time with you all. And uh, Aziza, over to you. Thanks a lot, Ravi. Thank you.